it lined up. This meeting is being live streamed by staying in this meeting. You consent to being live streamed. Anyone with access to live stream can watch or share with others. Got it. And so with us this morning, we have Vishnu Dutt Das and Krishna Chaitanya Das of the, the Ooh-Ah. Ooh-Ah. And there's Suvashini Kumar. Hari Bho. Hare Krishna, Subhashini Kumar. It's always a, a pleasure to see you. Ooh, ah, what is that? UA? United Artists? Ukraine. Ukraine. Oh. Don't know what to do. Okay, Slava Ukraini. Yeah? Slava <laughs> Ukraini. Good luck, you guys. You know, I know it's very difficult. The hard, hard life sometimes. Sometimes we're <laughs> Right? This adversity, we can't understand why. It doesn't make any sense to us. You know, later perhaps it will make sense or not. You know, some things are very difficult to understand. I don't understand all these political things, but I feel I feel for the people of Ukraine. I met some really wonderful people over there. Uh I, I found that the Ukrainian folks that I met were very interested in uh, spiritual life and especially the point of view of uh, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and our particular school of Bhakti Yoga uh, because we I went to a Veda Life festival there a few years back. I think it was 2018, but I'm, I can't remember so well. Uh, Avadut Maj organized a, a big section of a park <clears throat> into different lokas. There was, uh, you know, Vaikuntha and Vrindavan and Ayodhya Dham on one side, and on the other side was Shiva Loka <laughs> and Brahma Loka. Yeah. And uh, I remember we were giving lectures and uh, I asked, I think it was Ras, Rasananda, uh, who's the big, who's the big devotee over there who organizes everything? He's skinny and tall. He has a little beard like that. Yes. That is Rasananda. Yeah, him. That's so, him, yeah. Yeah, so I said, where am I going to speak? And he said, oh, it's over this way. And I saw this huge pandal with uh, big hay bales. And I thought, oh, this looks like a great place to preach. I'm so happy there's five microphones up there, big speakers. And I said, is this it? And they said, no, no, it's a little further down. And then I saw there was a smaller stage, a little more humble setup. And I said, oh, is this it? And no, Madhusudan Maharaj will speak there. Oh. And then they led me over to like a, a tree where they had uh, a bit of a tent above the tree to protect you from the sun. And there's nobody there. And they said, here, this is your spot. I thought, well, okay. And I sat down, and they gave me a little microphone. And I just began speaking at random when uh, a couple of people came over and sat down. And then I continued speaking. And after about five or six minutes, I had about 35 people listening to me, talking about atma, karma, yoga, bhakti. And I was very impressed at... Uh, out of nowhere, uh, suddenly, a big crowd of Ukrainian folk appeared just to listen to the message of the Bhagavad Gita. So I found that the people of uh, Ukraine were very open to the message, much more so than a lot of people in other countries. Perhaps that's because there's a greater need and when there's a need, when there's a necessity, uh, 
then people come forward and they're interested in hearing about transcendental life, spiritual life. Whereas when everything is fine, when everything is going perfectly, uh, we think, well, what need do I have for any contemplation? I have money, I have Netflix, I have a big flat screen TV, I've got a nice car and a beautiful wife and lovely children. Everything is perfect. What need do I have of Krishna? So sometimes adversity brings out the best in us, but uh, I hope that the adversity there in Ukraine is resolved as quickly as possible because I don't like to see my friends over there suffer. Anyways, so it's good to have you on board. Krishna Chaitanya Das of Ukraine. And there's Ananta Shesh of Spain, Bienvenido, Nirupama Didi, and Shubhashni Kumar, of course, from Wexford, Ireland, with all the friends uh, there in Ireland, including Kumar. And there's Kirti Dadi, there she is. There's best, best doshas on the planet. Excellent prasad. There's Kirtida Didi and Radha Sundara Didi and Scarlet Bloom and Abhi Ram. I don't see Marie Ugoric this morning. <laughs> well, we're we're here to discuss this book, just as the Prapana Jivanamritam, or Life Nectar of the Surrendered Souls. And the idea of this book is to try to give solace and comfort to the devotees, as we were saying. This is not an easy path. Uh, the prospect is high, but the path is, is difficult. It's not lined with roses. There may be thorns on the path. And uh, so this book is to help us get some perspective and uh, to give us hope. And uh, we're going to start this morning with the 25th verse of the fourth chapter. Remember, we're talking about Patikulyasya uh, Varjanam, or giving up things that are not helpful for your devotional path. Um, there's, there are many obstacles on the path. And so we're trying to understand the nature of of some of these obstacles. And um, Srila Sridhar Maharaj comments here at the 25th verse. He says, Akaintika bhaktasya um, kshaya vashishta dosha darshanagraho varjaniya. So the word varjaniya, it means uh, should be given up. So, a kaintika bhaktasya kshaya vashishta dosha darshana graho. One should give up the tendency to find the dying remnants of personal defects in exclusive devotees. A kaintika bhakta. That means one who's completely dedicated to God, Krishna and guru. <laughs> and uh, so it may be possible to find defects in such a person, but our tendency for criticism should be held in check. So here Sri Dharmarsh quotes Rupa Goswami, and Rupa Goswami comments in his Upadeshamrita, the verse 6, Drishtai svabhava janitar vapushash chadoshar na prakritatvam iha bhakta janasya parshyat gangam basham na kalu bud buddha fena vankar brahma dravatvam apagachchati niradharabai. So Rupa Goswami, who is the head of our sampradaya in an important way, we're known as the Rupanuga bhaktas gives us an important comparison here. He says that if you look at the Ganges, sometimes you'll see that the water is dark, it's covered with bubbles, maybe foam, mud, 
And so you might think, well, this water is contaminated. But despite whatever apparent defects may appear in the Ganges, uh, the water of the Ganges is always sacred. It's always holy water. You can use it to bless the dead or the living. And so in the same way, uh, Rupa Goswami says, don't look at the body or the svabhava of a Vaishnava in an ordinary way. Now, the word svabhava is very interesting because Bhagavad Gita, in a way, it's a, re it's a reflection on the problem of svabhava. It means one's particular nature. And that might be determined by one's birth. Svabhava janita, jana. That means birth. Trishtai uh, svabhava janita vapachast chadoshaya. You might find some defect there. So this means, svabhava means you may come from a Brahmana back. Ground. You may come from a Kshatriya background or Vaishya or Shudra. In India, you see different castes. But Rupa Goswami says, don't look at a Vaishnava in terms of his caste. This will be uh, an impediment for you. It will be the same as if you look at the Ganges and misinterpret uh, the nature of the Ganges, thinking, well, this water is contaminated, it's dirty, I can't touch that. No, the Ganges is sacred water, it's holy water. So in the same way, you may look at a, a Vaishnava devotee and find, oh, well, uh, this person is not of the highest caste. They're not of the Brahmin uh, caste. They're not of the highest Brahmin caste. So, therefore, it should be... Uh, Rejected. This is one point, Svabhava Janitai, uh, and also Vapusha, the body. <clears throat> you may look at a Vaishnava's body and find that this is the, not the kind of body that I can consider as worthy of worship. So you can look at this verse in many different ways. Uh, it may be considered a dosha or a fault if one has a female body. Uh, and you think, well, I cannot take instruction from a woman because this is a, a defective body in terms of what's recommended uh, through the Vedic tradition. We're really supposed to accept guidance only from men. So gurus should be masculine. But Srila Sri points out that after Nityananda Prabhu left the planet, uh, Janavi Mata, his wife, uh, became an important leader of the Vaishnavas at that time, including Maritam Das Thakur, uh, Srinivas Acharya, Shyamananda Pandit, and others who used to gather for the Chiradoi festival and Panihati, a chip rice festival, uh, where thousands of bhaktas would come and listen to the kata, the stories of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and the, the teachings of the six Goswamis. This would take place in East Bengal uh, under the auspices of Janavi Mata the wife of Nityananda Prabhu. And there's a whole sector of uh, Goswaminis who come from that line. And they're not to be taken lightly. So, Trishtai Svabhava Janitar Vapushas Chadosha. We are all flawed vessels. None of us are perfect. And you can look at the outward form of a Vaishnava, and there will always be something that you can find fault with. And Rupa Goswami says, don't do that. 
Svobhava. <clears throat> Nowadays, since the time of Bhaktivedanta Swami especially, there are many preachers in the West. There are many Western devotees. And the Western devotees, we don't always understand the proper form that's given in Hindu tradition. We're not part of the Brahmana, Kattriya, Vaishya, Shudra, um, Chatur, you know, the four different castes. We come from outside that. Um, sometimes devotees will become proud, thinking, well, Srila Prabhupada told us that if you're a Vaishnava, automatically you're more than a Brahmin. And such proud individuals may go to the Jagannath temple in Puri and try to force their way in, saying, well, I'm an exalted soul. I come in the line of Rupa Goswami. But the pandas in the Jagannath temple, they're not having any of that. Their point of view is, according to your Savabhava, you're not you're not a Hindu. We can't allow you inside. But if you look at the tradition, you'll see that some of the great acharyas in our line, Haridas Thakur, the Namacharya, he considered himself too low to enter the Jagannath temple by way of his Muslim birth. <laughs> Rupa Sanatan Goswami, they were members in the court of uh, Hussein Shah, who was the Muslim king of Bengal at the time. And by association, uh, it was considered, well, these men are, are contaminated by association with Muslims. Uh, back in the 15th and 16th century, there was a lot of tension between Hindus and Muslims. And sometimes the Muslims would play tricks to decast uh, the Hindus. I read a story the other day where they were explaining the line of Rabindranath Tagore and his ancient ancestors in Bengal and sometime around the 16th or 17th century. There's a story that one of his ancestors became a Muslim in the following way. Uh, he noticed that a, a Muslim friend of his or associate during Ramadan, uh, which is a time of month where the, uh, the Muslims fast for something like 30 days. They have to fast until sundown. And uh, he saw that his friend uh, was smelling uh, an orange. And he chided his friend, saying, well, don't you know, uh, smelling is as good as eating. So if you are smelling that orange, you've already broken your vow. You, you've broken your fast, because smelling and eating are the same. And his Muslim friend said, oh, really? Explain that again. Well, uh, if you're smelling something and thinking about food, you're having the same experience. So you broke your fast. Oh, a few months later, uh, the Hindu ancestor of Rabindranath Tagore had organized some kind of a festival. And then his Muslim frenemy uh, came to that festival with a big tray of roasted meat, and he walked through the hall. I don't know how this happened, but it's recorded in the history of uh, Rabindranath Tagore's family. And so the ancestor of Rabindranath Tagore complained, saying, what are you doing here? Get out. That smells terrible. That's, a, that's abominable. You've brought meat into my household. Leave now. And uh, his 
friend said, oh, then you can smell this? And he says, yes, of course, that's abominable. Remove that immediately. So his friend said, well, smelling is eating. And so you have now become contaminated. You are no longer a Hindu. And uh, the ancestor of Rabindranath Thakur was so ashamed. Uh, he felt that he had spoken truly. And that by simply smelling, uh, he was guilty of the sin of eating beef. And so he converted to Islam. And so there's an ancestor of Rabindranath. Uh, who became a Muslim simply by smelling meat. Well, considering how strict the caste divisions were 500 years ago, uh, Rupa Goswami, Sanatan Goswami, they were considered to be something like outcasts, Haridas Thakur, so these great soul saints did not presume to enter the temple of Jagannath in Puri, thinking, oh no, we are very close to Krishna. And by the same token, Rupa Goswami, the head of our sampradaya in many ways, uh, warns us, try not to see others in terms of caste or uh, bodily distinction. And this is very important because we live in a time where uh, social division is promoted uh, as a way of maintaining power by very demonic politicians. And racism in particular is being used as a tool to divide people. But surely Rupa Goswami is telling us here, don't take that into consideration, the sort of fault. It's not a proper way of distinguishing. So Srila Prabhupada comments that being situated in his original Krishna conscious position, a pure devotee does not identify with the body. Such a devotee should not be seen from a materialistic point of view. Indeed, one should overlook a devotee's having a body born in a low family, a body with a bad complexion, a deformed body, or a diseased or infirm body. According to ordinary vision, such imperfections seem prominent in the body of a pure devotee. But despite such seeming defects, the body of a pure devotee cannot be polluted. It is exactly like the waters of the Ganges, which sometimes during the rainy season are full of bubbles, foam, and mud. The Ganges water do not become polluted. Those who are advanced in spiritual understanding will bathe in the Ganges without considering the condition of the water. Srila Prabhupada comments that Shuddha Bhakti, the activity of the soul proper, in other words, engagement in the transcendental loving service of the Lord is performed in a liberated condition. So one who engages in bhakti yoga transcends the modes of material nature and comes to the spiritual level. So what Prabhupada is making clear here is that there must be no distinction made in reference to caste or bodily defect when thinking of a devotee or Vaishnava. So this is good news because it means our particular line is inclusive. We're not saying that you can only become involved in this particular kind of dharma given that you're a Kshatriya or a Vaishya or a Shudra. And in fact, a guru can come from any one of those lines, Brahman, Katriya, Vaishya, Shudra, if he is pure in Krishna consciousness. So according to mundane considerations, 
uh, it may be said that Ramananda Roy was a shudra, that Rupa and Sanatan Goswami were contaminated by association with the Islamic Shah and his court, all of whom were meat eaters. As we pointed out, in the India of the time, this would have been a severe disqualification. Uh, then again, both Advaita Charya and Srivas Pandit were married household grihastas. They weren't sannyasis. And yet we revere their holy names as part of the Panchatattva, or the fivefold divine avatars of Sankirtan. Every time we uh, chant the Hare Krishna mantra on our Japa beads. So Srila Prabhupada concludes, he says, what should be taken into consideration is the spiritual master's main business, which is devotional service or pure service to the Supreme Lord. And then he quotes from Bhagavad Gita, Apichat Sudaracharo, Bajete Mamananya Bhak, Sadureva Samantavya, Samyak Vyavasito Hisaha. Now, this is even taking this a step further because your svabhava is determined by your birth and um, your body you can't really do too much about but here Krishna is saying even one's achar one's activities may appear to be abominable but you can't look at the activities of a great soul Vaishnava and subject them to the same criteria. Uh, if you look at Nityananda Prabhu, for example, sometimes in mad ecstasy of divine love, taking the holy name of, of Krishna, he would forget to dress himself, and he would wander the streets uh, telling everyone, take the name, take the name. Hari Bolo, Hari Bolo, Bolo Hari, Bolo Hari. Completely naked. So, the Bhagavad Gita says, even if a devotee sometimes seems to engage in abominable activities, he should be considered a sadhu, a saintly person, because his actual identity is that of one engaged in loving service of the Lord. In other words, he is not to be considered an ordinary human being, but a saintly person. So, Srila Sridhar Maharaj uses uh, Bhaktivinoda Thakur's Bengali to translate this. But I think we've given the meaning, so we'll go to the next verse, which says... Uh, Something very similar from the Srimad Bhagavatam. Paradoshanu uh, Shilanam Varjaniyam. The practice of finding faults in others must be abandoned. So, fault finding in general is a negative tendency. And sometimes we hear, well, a sadhu is one who cuts. We see that Srila Prabhupada was very critical, especially of his own Western devotees. And his disciples uh, oftentimes uh, tried to imitate him. And so to help train someone in Krishna consciousness, uh, they could be very critical. And then if you complain, saying, well, why are you criticizing so much? They would say, well, the sadhu is one who cuts. But Srila Sridhar here is, is warning us, stay away from uh, too much criticism. Uh, as Jesus Christ says in the Bible, he says, uh, don't. Criticize someone else because he has a piece of dust in his eye. Remove the big piece of wood from your own eye first. Or physician, heal thyself. So there's this verse in the Bhagavatam that Srila Sridhar Maharaj quotes, Parasvabhava karmani ya 
prasam sati nindati sa asu prasyate svartad asatya bini veshataha. He says, whoever indulges in praising or criticizing the qualities and behavior of others will quickly become deviated from his own best interest by his entanglement in illusory dualities. In other words, to pointlessly judge others is a defect. And such a practice must be abandoned. O Uddhava, you should neither praise nor abuse the nature and actions of others, because you will become preoccupied with falsehood, and your best self-interest will be lost. So, to sort of back the idea that's being given by Krishna, don't criticize the devotees. Uh, Sri Dharmaraj quotes from Krishna again, instructing Uddhava, where he says, really, to involve yourself in criticism, it's not useful. So, this may seem like a remote idea, because we will think, well, no, as a, as a devotee, I, I'm a good boy. I don't criticize other people. Uh, I try to mind my own business. But one area where devotees should be careful, especially, is getting involved in mundane politics and uh, conspiracy theories and things like that, because uh, conspiracy theories work on the basis of cynicism. Uh, cynicism means to question the motives of others, to question the sincerity of others. There's the old saying about seeing a glass half full. So the uh, optimist sees a glass of water, and it, it, it has 50% water. And he thinks, oh, the glass is half full. Where the pessimist says, oh, no, the glass is half empty. But the cynic will say, oh, no, the glass is poisoned. So if we are constantly looking at the rest of the world thinking, oh, this is Maya, that's Maya, all those people out there are in Maya, the temple is good, the devotees are good, but the people outside the temple are bad, they're Mayic. <clears throat> They're coming from a false perspective. Uh, it, this is to become very cynical and question everyone's motive. And when you become cynical, your heart becomes very hard. Of course, the opposite of that is to be naive. Uh, but to err on the side of naivete is better than to err on the side of cynicism, because constant cynicism will destroy your bhakti. So, constantly criticizing others and saying, oh, uh, these people are evil, they're involved in a, a plot against me, they're poisoning the air, they're poisoning the water, is also dangerous because you enter into a cult mentality. And personally, I don't think that's useful. So when Krishna talks about finding fault with one's nature, he pointedly uses the word svabhav, which means one's nature. This is... Um, with reference to the Bhagavad Gita, when Krishna discusses with Arjun, Arjun is constantly bringing up, how do I adjust my nature with Dharma? And this is a big theme in the Bhagavad Gita. But Krishna finally insists that Svabhav and Svadharma are unimportant considerations when it comes to Shuddha Bhakti or unalloyed divine love. So he says, uh, Sarva Dharma Prityaja 
Mame kam sharanam vraja. Give up all these different mundane relative considerations about caste and dharma and come to me. Uh, And Srila Sridhar Maharaj explains this concept of apichat sudaracharo, bhajate mam ananyabhak. He says he may be considered most disqualified from the st standpoint of purity of this world. <clears throat> For example, we used to have to go out and distribute books in the street to try to promote Krishna consciousness. But there's no, I, I used to go to downtown Los Angeles and hand out books and preach to people. And um, downtown Los Angeles is a very impure place. So from the standpoint of purity, it was completely disqualifying. And yet, to try to engage people in the Sankirtan movement by chanting Hare Krishna, by giving them books and so on. Uh, it's a very purifying experience. We used to go out to uh, 1970s. We'd go to the corner of 7th and Broadway in downtown Los Angeles, dressed in our dhotis and uh, tennis shoes and uh, bang on the drum and chant Hare Krishna to thousands of people every day. Uh, and we would come home completely ecstatic, uh, eat a very humble meal, and then uh, go to the RT. But we were illuminated. So from the standpoint of purity, you look at sometimes what the devotees are doing, you think, wait a minute, that doesn't look pure to me. but Krishna says, if he has an exclusive tendency towards me, a spontaneous flow towards me, this is Srila Srinivas speaking, avoiding any other direction, sadhureva samantavya, it should be considered a sadhu because the nirguna flow is to be considered. Other things may be there now, but they will vanish the next moment. You may fail to understand but he's all right. He must be considered a sadhu, a real, honest man, and nothing else. He has no obligation to name, fame, or the other things which attract us. He has self-contentment. Contentment does not require anything. It can stand alone. That is fulfillment. And Krishna consciousness is so self-sufficient that it does not depend on anything to establish itself being self-established. So you may fail to understand uh, the activities of a great soul. This is me. Just as you may fail to understand the activities of the gopis. So if you take this to the highest level, you look at the, the Vaishnavas and the saints Look at Nityananda Prabhu and think, well, how can this, how can this be purity? Uh, the path of perfection. Purity is the force. But you can't imitate Nityananda Prabhu. Nityananda Prabhu is an avidut, our own avidut Mara. She's difficult to imitate. You'll find him traveling all over the world, preaching Krishna consciousness, great energy. From Ukraine to Russia, to Thailand, to the United States, constantly preaching. But then again, he's also getting on and off airplanes and in and out of airports, which are very dirty, contaminated places. But you cannot imitate Avadut Maharaj. You cannot imitate an Avadut. And what to speak of the gopis? The kind of divine love found in the gopis of Vrindavan is especially fine and spotless dedication to divinity. Unfortunately, ordinary people cannot grasp this or understand it. People read the 10th canto of the Bhagavatam for entertainment, 
when they think, oh, little Krishna, he's so sweet, he's so beautiful. And I like the valiant Krishna of the Mahabharata, but why did why did he kill Karna? So being captivated by an interesting story, this is one thing, it's nice, but be careful about overlooking the fact that Krishna is the supreme personality of Godhead, according to our understanding. You can't understand his activities. And the gopis in Vrindavan are the greatest souls. You can't understand their activities. So don't look at that and think that it's mundane. The Vedas want to be born as blades of grass in Vrindavan so they can take the dust of the gopis on their heads. Uh, so don't consider the activities of the gopis as being somehow immoral. This is a most unfortunate lack of understanding. And so having kind of set up that idea that, well, in the end, the most exalted position of the pure devotees of Vrindavan is exemplified by uh, Srimati Radharani, the Hare Hare Krishna. Then uh, Srila Sridhar quotes uh, from the Manashiksha of Raghunath Das Goswami, uh, and which is the final verse in this chapter four. Braja Rasasri Tanam Bukti Mukti Spriha Tata Aishvarya Mishra by Kunta Patiseva Pityajat Venagamya, Asad Bartavesha Vishrija Mati Sarva Svaharani, Katamukti Vyagra Nasrinu Kila Sarvatma Gilana, Apityatva Lakshmi Pati Ratim Miti Vyomanayanim, Braje Radha Krishna Svarati Manido. And this can be translated as follows. For the pure devotees who have taken refuge in the mellow of pure devotion in Vrindavan, even the reverential service of Lord Narayana is considered to be as adverse as the aspiration. for worldly pleasure or liberation. But Srila Sridhar quotes Bhaktivinoda Thakur, uh, who has written this up as a poetic tribute to the Manashiksha of Raghana Das. Krishna Varta Vinaana Asad Varta Balijana Seveshya Ati Bhayankari Shri Krishna Vishaya Mati Jiver Dur Labati Shevesha Mati Laya Hari Suna Mana Bali Hetumai Mukta Nami Sardulini Tarakata Jari Shuni Sarvat Masampati Gili Koi Tadu Bai Chagakara Mukti Kata Pori Hara Lakshmi Pati Rati Rakadure and so on which I translated as follows. Krishna's message is so pure, other words you must abjure, words unchaste, apparel and unkind. Krishna Prem is not so easy, hard for jivas to achieve. Unchaste idols may steer away your mind. Unchaste ideals may steal away your mind. Oh, dear mind, please hear my pleading. Liberation is a tiger. Her promise means soul suicide. She'll take your soul and steal it if you let her. Nirvana offers sleep forever. Don't listen to her promises of sweet nothings. She'll devour the treasures of the Atma. Give these up. Abandon the promise of liberation on Nirvana. Their sweet words are hard to leave aside. 
Then on even a higher level, leave attraction for almighty four-armed Lord Narayan of Vaikuntha. By attraction to that plane, you'll be hurled down to the realm of awe and reverence, denied the chance to live in Sri Vrindavan. Only love for Radha Krishna and Vraja bestows the most precious treasure. Adore them in your heart eternally. So the humble Bhaktivinoda Thakur humbly bows to the holy lotus feet of Rupa and Raghunath, to them in all humility, I pray for such devotion. Iti Shri Prapanachivanamritam Shri Bhaktivachanam Mritantagata Pratikulya Vivarjanam Namachaturta Dhyaya. Thus ends the fourth chapter of the Prapanajivanamritam in the matter of rejection of the unfavorable words of nectar from the devotees. So that's my that's my talk for this morning. I hope we didn't bore you with all the pauses, reading of esoteric Sanskrit, but it's a very simple uh, section here, in a sense. Uh, Srila Sridhar is quoting Rupa Goswami, saying, don't criticize the outward aspect of a Vaishnava, especially caste, body, uh, and even activities, because you may not understand what a devotee is doing. You may look at what a devotee is doing and just go, what, what is that? I don't follow. Srila Sridharmash would sometimes read the newspaper, and people would look at him and think, what are you doing? But then... Chirtnamara said, whether Srila Sridharmas reads the newspaper or the Vedas, it's the same. Because he would, he would find things in the newspaper that he could use to connect with, with people. He could speak of relativity or uh, Einstein, Einsteinian theory or quantum physics or electricity. Like the other day I was reading, he said something about Someone asked him, you know, if we do this and then if we do that, is, is that the thing? And Srila Sridharma said, well, it depends if there's electricity there. You may have the wiring, but if there's no electricity, what good is it? So you may have a beautiful machine with excellent gold wires, but if there's no electricity, it's useless. So find where is the electricity? Where's the light coming from? So if you see someone with a defective body, uh, they're an American, for example, <laughs> or uh, old, or black, and you think, oh, no, no. But is the light there? After Srila Prabhupada disappeared, passed away. His disciples did their best to try to carry the, on the mission. But some people, like myself, I felt, I'm not getting any light here. I, I'm, I, I, the machine is there, but where's the electricity? And we went to India, and we found Srila Sridharmarsh. And many people said, no, 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 no. You see, he belongs to this section, which is not our section, and it's a different school. And we have to get past all that. But hearing Srila Sridharmas' message, we, we saw, wow, this is amazing. I'm not only getting a little bit of a, there's, there's gradations of uh, electricity also, you know, there's those little batteries that have two posts here. And sometimes you don't know, does that have any electricity? In the old days, you used to put that on your tongue and see if you get a shock, you know. And if it's hot, you go, ooh, okay, that'll work. 
but sometimes it's really hot. And you go, bam, ooh, that's a good battery. And there's the electricity you get from a tiny battery and the electricity you get from a huge transformer that's driving an entire city. So meeting Srila Sridhar was like that. It was like getting an electric shock. Our heads were on fire. Nobody knew anything about Srila Sridhar So I went back to California and I worked with uh, Goswami Maharaj and we created the search for Sri Krishna. Uh, Sri Guru and his grace. Uh, the golden volcano of divine love, the loving search for the lost servant, subjective evolution of consciousness. Those are only five books. You can produce many, many more. But our heads were on fire from the electric shock. Now I see thousands and thousands of images of Srila Sridhar Maharaj on Facebook, on Instagram. Everyone's promoting him. The other day, the whole world is celebrating his divine disappearance day. I can't celebrate that. It breaks my heart. I don't want to think that he's not here with us. But we are not Catholic Christians from the medieval times who worship relics. And we think, oh, I have a I have a pair of Srila Sridharmarsha's socks. You know. But that's not the real thing. The thing is the teachings. Try to keep the teachings alive. You'll be amazed. The very powerful, very deep, uh, profound teachings. It's nice to have a temple with a photo of Srila Sridhar Maharaj there and bow down and wave incense and say, oh, he was a great saint. But consider the life-transforming teachings of Srila Sridhar Maharaj, which you can find in this book or by speaking with his disciples and uh, disciples of Govinda Maharaj who were trying to keep the uh, flame. And you'll see, here's some powerful electricity coming through here. But you can't always judge a book by a cover. You can't always tell a thing by its outer form. So Rupa Goswami is telling us, avoid that. And Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, even the actions, you may not understand. And then he tells Uddhava, in fact, <clears throat> criticizing others is not such a good path. Stay away from that. And why? Because the greatest, greatest devotees, they do things that cannot be understood and then finally, the example is given of the, the gopis of Vrindavan. How can we understand the love that the gopis have for Krishna? Here's the supreme absolute truth, God himself. And yet, here's on the other side, his energy, the yin to his yan. And there's so much love there that God himself is captivated by it, and he dies as God to live again as his own devotee, as Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, the golden volcano of divine love, whose ecstasy is such that it saturates the entire world in, in the Sankirtan uh, chanting of Hare Krishna, taking of the holy name of Krishna. So the devotees of Krishna and Braja, the gopis, personified it by Radha Krishna, Radha, Sri Radha, Hare, Hare Krishna. And that concludes his chapter on what to avoid. Now, it's curious that Srila Sridhar he does not give you a list uh, of things to avoid, like in the Bible, in Leviticus, there's a long list of things to be careful about. Like, for example, in Hari Bhakti Vilas, it will say, do not offer to Krishna food that has been seen by a dog. <laughs> Why not? Well, because the, the dog is greedy and envious. Dogs are always thinking about food. And he saw that prasadam. 
And so his vibration of greed went into that. You don't want to offer that to Krishna. So Hari Bhakti Vilas is filled with things like that. It's Pancharatra. But Srila Sri she's trying to nourish you. He's trying to encourage you. And, and he's not telling you a long list of things that you should avoid doing. But he's keeping it sort of general. And especially avoid criticizing the devotees. Why? Because some, they're very fragile. They're very, we're all very fragile, very vulnerable people in, in difficult situations, trying to nurture a little spark of devotion. And don't destroy that with gossip and harsh language, even harsh thought. That doesn't mean that you have to do everything that a devotee tells you. It doesn't mean that you can't have differences. I remember when I lived in the temple, uh, I had to share a living space with a devotee from the south. He was from Georgia. And I had an accent, you kind of talk like this. And I hated that accent. It just made me crazy every time he spoke. But I had to tolerate and keep that down. Later on, I read somewhere that uh, the father of Krishna, Vasudev, did not get along with his father-in-law, Ugrasen, the father of Devaki. He was his in-law. He didn't get, he didn't like him. And I thought, well, that's that's nice. It means like I don't have to like everybody. So it's okay if you don't like somebody, but avoid harsh criticism of other devotees. So Mahaprabhu says, Trinata Pisu Nichena Tarora Pisu Hishnuna. Try to be humble and tolerate and make it through one more day chanting Hare Krishna. All right, my friends, any questions from any quarter? No? Okay, an hour is plenty. All right, well, thank you very much. Spasiba, hardship. Spasiba to all my friends in Russia and uh, Ukraine, and uh, muchas gracias. If uh, Anata Shesh is still there, and Danyavad to the Hindi speakers out there, and uh, God bless all of you. We'll see you next week. All right, Hari Krishna. Jai Mahayogi Prabhu Ki Jai. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Mahayogi Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Thank you very much. Please accept our obeisances. See you next week. Большое спасибо. Пожалуйста, примите наши поклоны. Увидимся на следующей неделе. Дандавац. Hare Krishna.